Chapter Two, Part One of Explorers and Travelers by Adolphus W. Greeley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by William Tomko. Chapter Two, Peter Lemoyne, Sieur Deberville, Founder of Louisiana, Part One. Among the very earliest settlers of Hochelega, now Montreal, was the son of a Norman innkeeper, a young French lad of fifteen. Charles Le Moyne, who came to this Indian village in 1641. Apt, strong, dairy, and zealous, he soon became one of the most efficient aids to French power. The language, the woodcraft, the arts of the savage soon became his, and added to these such suavity of manner, clearness of perception, and native kindness as made him loved equally by French and savage as interpreter soldier negotiator and captain of the guard he rendered such great service to the young and exposed colony as caused him to be made captain of montreal and later in sixteen sixty eight to be ennobled by louis the fourteenth under the title of sieur of longueuil for four years service in the country of the hurons he received for his entire pay the sum of twenty crowns and his clothing but he gained also such a knowledge of the possibilities of the country such an insight into indian character and such a wealth of vigorous manhood as enabled him to acquire during his life an estate that was princely he did better than this he married a woman worthy of him whose family is scarcely known catherine thierry an adopted daughter of antoine primo in all the history of american families there is none that has as distinguished and brilliant a history as the twelve sons and two daughters born of this french peasant and the son of a norman innkeeper in the forests of canada the two daughters married nobles and of the twelve sons nine lived distinguished in history three of them were killed in the service of france ten of them were ennobled and four iberville serigny chateau gay and bienville the younger played important parts in the founding of louisiana there were many brilliant and picturesque figures among the actors in the founding of a new france in the wilds of north america but among them all there was scarcely one whose personality and deeds excited more admiration among his contemporaries or whose services and career are more deserving of recognition by posterity than peter le moyne sir deberville third son of longueuil who was born on the extreme frontier at the outpost of montreal july sixteenth sixteen sixty one as a soldier he rose to be the leader and idol of his fellow canadians as a sailor he became an extremely skillful navigator who was acknowledged as one of the greatest of french naval commanders and as an explorer and administrator he so successfully accomplished his plans as to merit and receive the title of the founder of louisiana the freedom vigor and wildness of canadian life developed men early and iberville entered the french navy as midshipman at the age of fourteen his first service of note however was as a soldier in the wilds of his native land in the canadian overland campaign to recover possession of an indian trading post on hudson bay which it was claimed the english had illegally seized iberville volunteered for this campaign under detroit and exhibited such judgment and vigor as caused him to be put in command of a small party of nine some say twelve men with two canoes wherewith he did not hesitate to attack and compel the unconditional surrender of an english ship manned by fourteen including the commander of hudson bay st helene his brother meantime captured another vessel and with the two as means of transport the two brothers pushed down to fort quichichoen which surrendered after withstanding a sharp cannonade these victories not only ensured to the french the command of the entire southern part of hudson bay but put them in possession of a vast amount of stores indeed so destructive to english interests were the campaigns of iberville in sixteen eighty seven eighty eight that the hudson bay company declared that their actual losses amounted to one hundred eight thousand five hundred twenty pounds sterling an enormous sum in the young colonies of that day the consequential losses must have been very great for we are told that the value of furs obtained in the trade of one year amounted to four hundred thousand livres francs 
Iberville remained in charge of the country which his valor had recaptured, and in 1688, while the Iroquois were ravaging Canada, waged successful war in Hudson Bay. One of his lieutenants, captured an English official, found on him an order from the London Company to proclaim English sovereignty over the whole bay. Later, two ships, with twenty-eight cannon and eight swivels, appeared before St. Anne in order to expel the French. Eventually, Iberville compelled the surrender of the English ships, and, releasing the smaller vessel for the safe transport of such prisoners as he paroled, himself navigated the larger ship, with eleven Hudson Bay pilots held prisoners, to Quebec through Hudson Strait. In 1690, Iberville volunteered, under his brother St. Helene, for the retaliatory expedition in midwinter against Schenectady, wherein a large number of the inhabitants of that unhappy town were ruthlessly massacred by the French and their Indian allies. Iberville seems to have exerted his influence to restrain the savagery of the Indians and save the life of at least one Englishman. It seems that the success of the young Canadian had attracted attention in France, and when, in 1691, through the efforts of the Northern Company, Louis the Fourteenth had decided to recover Port Nelson, Hudson Bay, from the English. Dutast came to Quebec with fourteen sail. It was with express orders that Iberville should be entrusted with a share of the work and glory. Dutast objected to such division of honor, and by plausible objections as to the lateness of the season, although it was only the 16th of July, succeeded in delaying the departure of the expedition for that year. Iberville seemed determined to show the speciousness of the reasons, for he made a trip to the bay and brought back in 1691 two ships loaded with furs, much to the consolation of Frontenac. He immediately went to France to advance the expedition against Port Nelson, which he knew was much favored at court. Iberville found favor with the king, who gave him two ships for the reduction of Port Nelson and orders to guard it after reduction. Delays in France and contrary winds on the Atlantic brought Iberville to Quebec only in October, far too late for the safe navigation of Hudson Bay. To fill in his time, he set forth to take Pemaquid, but did not make an attack, this being the only instance in his long career where he failed to show extreme daring, even against desperate odds. The delay of the vessels was unfortunate for France, as far as Hudson Bay was concerned, for in 1693 three English vessels attacked and captured St. Anne, with 50,000 peltries, and again the control of the bay passed from France. In September 1694, Iberville, with two ships, La Poli and La Charente, the former commanded by his brother de Serigny, appeared before Port Nelson, which he was six weeks in approaching owing to the heavy moving ice which nearly destroyed his vessel the fort had a double palisade thirty-two cannon and swivels in the main body and fourteen cannon in outer works the whole manned by fifty-three men iberville landed without hesitation invested the fort with forty canadians worked with his usual energy and skill and in fourteen days he had his outworks established his batteries placed and mortars in position. His final summons for surrender resulted in the capitulation of the fort, on condition that personal property should be spared and safe transport be given the garrison to England the coming year. His success was saddened for Iberville by the death of the elder Chateau Guay, the third of his brothers to fall in the service of his king, who perished while gallantly repelling a sortie of the beleaguered garrison. The name of Port Nelson was changed to Fort Bourbon, and the river was rechristened St. Therese, because, says Jeremy, in his relation de la Baie de Hudson, the capitulation was made on October 14th, the day of that holy saint. The victory did not prove to be cheap, for scurvy, then the dreaded scourge of the sailor, broke out during the long, dark, excessively cold winter, and caused the death of twenty men. Late the next summer, after waiting to the last moment for the English ships he counted on capturing, and leaving a garrison of 67 at Fort Bourbon, Iberville sailed for Quebec. But the winds were so contrary, and his crew so debilitated by scurvy, that he turned his prows to France, and fortunately arrived at Rochelle October 9, 1695. His victories in Hudson Bay so commended him to the king that Iberville was charged with the reduction and destruction of the strong fort 
which James II of England had erected at Pemaquid, Maine. While on this cruise, our Canadian fell in with three English ships near the mouth of the St. John. He unhesitatingly attacked them, dismasted, fired, and captured the flagship of the squadron, the Newport, a ship of 80 men and 24 guns. Reinforced by several hundred Indians, as a land and besieging force, Iberville arrived at Pemaquid, August 13, 1696, and invested the fort the next day. He summoned the commander, Colonel Chubb, to capitulate, but that officer replied that, if the sea was covered with French vessels and the land with Indians, he would not surrender until compelled to do so. Iberville promptly landed and used such expedition that within the short space of thirteen hours he established his batteries in position and opened fire, when the garrison surrendered on honorable terms. Iberville, doubtless mindful of his experiences at Schenectady, took the wise and humane precaution of quartering his prisoners under the guns of the royal ships, so as to secure them from the fury of his bloodthirsty allies, the Indians, who desired to supplement the entire destruction of the fort by the slaughter of the garrison. In withdrawing from the demolished post, while doubling the island at the mouth of the Penobscot, he had an opportunity of justifying his reputation as the most skillful officer in the French service, for, falling in with an English squadron of seven sail, he successfully evaded them by bold seamanship along the very coastline of that dangerous and rock-bound shore. His capacity as a military commander was now to be tested charged by the king to cooperate in the reduction of newfoundland to french power iberville found himself viewed with jealousy by his colleague brouillon governor of placentia who assumed entire command interfered with iberville's contemplated movements and declared that his own troops the canadians should not accompany him on the opening campaign iberville Realizing the necessity of zealous and concerted action in an enterprise of such importance, decided to leave the field free to Brouillon, and so announced his intention of returning to France. Immediately, the Canadians declared to a man that they were bound to him alone, that Frontenac's orders recognized Iberville as commander, and finally, that they would return to Quebec sooner than accept another. Brouillon, recognizing that Iberville was the idol of his Canadian countrymen, and unable to deny that the king had confided all the enterprises to be undertaken during the winter to Iberville, made such concessions as brought about reconciliation. Nevertheless, the campaign undertaken against St. John's was marked by dissension. Iberville displayed his usual energy and gallantry in the advance and subsequent skirmishes which ultimately resulted in the surrender of St. John's, which was abandoned and destroyed by fire. The campaign was pursued with such energy and success that at the end of two months the English had nothing left in Newfoundland except Bonavista and Carbonier Island. During these operations, Iberville displayed marked ability in handling troops, both in the field and during siege operations. His eagerness to share every danger and willingness to undergo every hardship in common with his troops endeared him to all and contributed much to the enthusiasm with which his men followed him or obeyed his orders. In May 1697, his brother Serigny arrived at Placentia with four vessels, destined for the command of Iberville in a proposed attempt to again reduce Hudson Bay. With these ships, Le Pelican, 50 guns, Le Palmier, 40 guns, Le Profonde, Le Vesp, and a Brigantine, Iberville entered the mouth of Hudson Strait on August 3rd and was immediately beset with heavy ice. The floes were driven hither and thither with such violence by the currents that Iberville directed, as the best means of safety, that each vessel should moor itself to the largest attainable iceberg. This expedient saved four of the ships, but an unexpected movement of two large bergs crushed so completely the brigantine that she sank instantly, the crew barely escaping with their lives. After a besetment of twenty-four days, Iberville succeeded in extricating his vessel from the ice and passed into the bay. He was alone and in utter ignorance of the fate of his consorts, which had been hidden from view by the ice for the past seventeen days. Iberville was not the man to turn back, nor indeed to delay in an expedition which demanded haste, so he pushed on alone and reached Port Nelson on September 4th. 
the next morning he discovered three ships several leagues to the leeward tacking to enter the harbor he hoped that they were his consorts and he at once made signals which being unanswered showed that the ships were english it was indeed an english squadron consisting of the hampshire fifty two guns and two hundred and thirty men the hudson bay thirty two guns and the deringue also of thirty two guns against which force iberville had but one ship of fifty guns it was with reason that as jeremy says they flattered themselves with the idea of capturing iberville seeing that they were three to one and they were amazed at the boldness with which he attacked them indeed almost any other officer in the french navy would have considered an attack as simply madness but such desperate odds only served to stimulate to the highest degree the known courage and skill of iberville he cleared his decks for action and instantly quitting the shelter and supposed advantage of the harbor attacked the english squadron in the open sea where iberville doubtless counted that his skill in handling ship would inure to his benefit chalvois thus describes this desperate fight the cannonade opened about half-past nine in the morning and was kept up incessantly till one with great vigor on both sides meanwhile the pelican had only one man killed and seventeen wounded then iberville who had kept the weather gauge bore down straight on the two frigates pouring in several broadsides at close quarters in order to disable them at that moment he perceived the third the hampshire coming on with twenty-six guns in battery on each side with a crew of two hundred and thirty men he at once proceeded to meet her all his guns pointed to sink her ran under her lee yard-arm to yard-arm and having brought his ship to poured in his broadside this was done so effectively that the hampshire after keeping on about her own length went down iberville at once wore and turned on the hudson bay the ship of the remaining two that could most easily enter st Teresa river but as he was on the point of boarding her the commandant struck his flag and surrendered iberville then gave chase to the deringue the third which was escaping to the northeast and which was only a good cannon shot off but as that vessel was as good a sailor as his own ship he soon gave up the chase not daring to crowd sail having had much of his rigging cut two pumps burst his shrouds considerably injured hull cut up by seven cannon-balls and pierced at the water's edge with no way of stopping the leak he accordingly veered and sent the sieur de la salle in his boat with twenty-five men to man the prize he then proceeded to repair damage and having done so with great expedition he renewed the chase of the enemy who was now three leagues off he began to gain on him when in the evening the wind changed to the north and a thick fog suddenly rising he lost sight of the deringue this accident compelled him to rejoin the hudson bay and he anchored near the hampshire now almost out of sight and from which not a soul had been saved in this fight with an enemy more than twice his superior in guns and men iberville had sunk one ship captured another and put the third to flight but this was followed by other experiences which at the outset presented conditions apparently not less desperate and discouraging two days later pending his siege operations against port nelson a violent gale arose in which says charlevoix in spite of all d'iberville's efforts to ride it out and there was not perhaps in the french navy one more skilful in handling a ship he was driven ashore with his vessel the pelican and his prize the hudson bay the misfortune happened at night the darkness increasing the horrors of the storm and prevented them from beaching the vessels at a favorable place and so saving them and before the break of day they broke up and filled both vessels were crowded with wounded men and prisoners who endeavored as best they could to reach the shore in the storm and darkness twenty-three perished in the attempt but fortunately the receding tide left such shallows that the rest reached shore and most of the prisoners successfully sought the friendly shelter of fort nelson iberville now found himself in most desperate plight shipwrecked on a barren coast with a hostile garrison on land the return of the english ship at sea possible and destitute of provisions he turned to the wrecked vessels and found that it was possible to obtain from them cannon and other munitions of war and undismayed he set his cold wet and hungry crew at this task resolved to obtain food by carrying the english fort by assault 
At this juncture, his missing vessels, having extricated themselves from the ice of Hudson Strait, appeared, and the fort surrendered without putting Iberville to the last proof of his courage. As might be expected, Iberville became the hero of the day on his return to France in 1697. But, true to himself and his career, he sought the influence of friends at court only to obtain other difficult and dangerous service that might add to the glory of France. He was now to enter on a new career as an explorer, colonizer, and administrator, where, if he was to perform less brilliant deeds than in earlier life, he was destined to open up to settlement by his countrymen the fertile lands of Louisiana, and thus lay the foundations of its future greatness. It was now twelve years since the tragic fate of La Salle's colony on the coast of Texas had spread dismay and terror among all who had been especially interested in the scheme of French colonization on the Mississippi River. The sentiment seemed to be that the mouth of the great river could never be found, and that further effort would only result in useless sacrifice of life and vessels. With the march of time, however, these impressions of doubt and disaster had faded out of mind and as now the attention of the ministry was especially turned to that part of louisiana which could be reached from the st lawrence it appeared to iberville to be a suitable season to revive the project of discovering the mouth of the mississippi and of planting a colony a plan for the colonization of louisiana was formally submitted to the french government by monsieur de romanville while Iberville, for his part, pledged his reputation as a navigator both to find the mouth of the Mississippi and to successfully plant there a colony. The ministry were easily persuaded that the scheme was practicable and advantageous, their decision being doubtless affected by the knowledge that both Spain and England contemplated the early settlement of the northern coasts of the Gulf of Mexico it was even reported as afterwards transpired to be the truth that colonizing expeditions were already en route and in order to ensure protection should iberville first reach the ground count pontchartrain projected and arranged for the construction of a fort at the mouth of the mississippi as was always the case schemes of trade were interwoven with the policy of colonization and extension of the royal domain the principal objects of the trade proved fanciful or chimerical, being, first, the idea of making bison wool an article of trade, a scheme fostered in France by La Salle, and, second, in the hope that valuable pearl fisheries might be found. In Iberville's instructions, we find that one of the great objects proposed to the king, when he was urged to discover the mouth of the Mississippi, was to obtain wool from the cattle buffalo of that country and for this purpose these animals must be tamed and parked and the calves sent to france iberville worked with his usual energy and the expedition consisting of two small frigates the badine the marin and two norman fishing boats sailed from brest october fourth sixteen ninety eight it was Friday, but Iberville no more than Columbus minded the day, and in the reluctance of the other vessels, himself led in the Badine. A storm off Madeira caused the disappearance of one of the fishing boats, but after a short search, Iberville tarried no more than he did in the Hudson Straits for his missing consort, but pushed on and reached San Domingo early in December. Here, the governor, Ducasse, was so impressed with Iberville's elucidation of his projects that he expressed to the home government his opinion that the views and genius of Iberville seemed to equal his valor in war. End of chapter 2, part 1. Recording by William Tomko.